Uh, let's welcome uh, Peter Ramis, CTO of Zentric. Aaron Shans from uh, Power Inbox, Simon Trasler from uh, Rubicon Project. Thanks for coming, everyone. And uh, uh, I guess um, we can probably start off with talking about uh, the problem itself, right? So a little bit of background around uh, what, what do we really mean by workflows and uh, uh, what, what is the industry problem that we're talking about solving here? Do you want, do you want to get started, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I, I think what we've talked about extensively on the IB, like the VAS working groups, um, while defining VAS01 was kind of this observation that uh, uh, if you look back at the previous VAS versions, we've released VAS 2 in somewhere end of 2009. And then it took us three years to do VAS 3. And then another, what is it, four years to get to VAS 4. Uh, and then two and a half years now to get to VAS 1, right? So that's like now nine years in since the release of VAS 2. And then the observation is the majority of the industry still runs VAS 2. So, while we can be super optimistic about all the cool stuff we, we released in Vassar 1, the main question is how do we get people to, to upgrade, to, to actually move the industry forward to all these amazing new capabilities that we've launched. Um, and I feel that we've done a huge amount of work in Vassar 1 to actually kind of remove the, the reasons why uh, people haven't been doing that. Um, so I, I'm excited that we have a forum here to talk about that and show people why we believe that Vassar 1 will be different. Uh, so, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, Simon, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, SSAI and how that uh, comes into the story around workflows? Yeah, so for sure. Uh, really, I think the, the main issue uh, that we try to address with uh, 4.1 is about the request. That's really the, the key point, uh, to be able to pass more information in. Until this point, VAST has really been a specification about the response. And the... Really, uh, the key area with SSAI where that becomes important uh, is because the here you have a server that is acting um, in place of the client. Right? It's the thing which is talking to the ad server, fetching tags, and uh, executing those, and, uh, and so calling um, for demand. And the client really is just there as a, a dumb recipient of the of the video stream. And so the problem that creates for for us, the reason I'm here is that there's no clean way, there's no standard way to separate the information about the server making their request and the client that it's doing it for. And uh, so for us particularly, a Rubicon project, uh, that's caused a couple of problems with fraud detection. And um, we'll, we'll talk about those more in a second. Uh, and Aaron, uh, I'll, I'll let you talk about one of the, probably, probably one of the key reasons why we've added this uh, client signaling. Do you, do you want to get into that? Yeah. So really important when you actually talk about things. Everybody's aware of the actual client-side workflow where you have a player calling a server and they both understand each other really well. That's fine. Vast was created for that specific use case. Like Simon said, it was a response protocol, not a request protocol. The unfortunate part is now we're at the point in the industry where you have servers on behalf of the clients calling things and you have other servers calling other servers. So now you have this chain of events that could happen and the actual person providing the ad may not have any clue about the player that's going to run the ad itself. So it's important to understand that there's going to need a way to signal the actual functionality of the actual player to actually have an ad to actually serve to match that functionality. There's a couple of things in 4.1 and in the industry in general, the OMSDK for measuring verification. Even vPaid is still supported. And things like where you actually count impressions, all that stuff is very important to understand what is actually doing the signaling, what player capabilities there are on every step of the actual chain. So if the demand doesn't know what the actual supply is capable of, they're not going to actually have the correct ad to serve. So one of the other things that's really important is to serve one VAST tag. Too often do we actually serve multiple VAST tags that are basically the same thing, just slightly different because of the functionality. For instance, vPaid, non-vPaid, and stuff like that. So that's something we're trying to resolve with 4.1. Cool, thank you. Um, actually, let's dive a little deeper into uh, SSAI, uh, Simon, if you want to uh, get into that. Uh, and let us know if you want to uh, get, this, get that picture up, too. Uh, sure. About that. I guess that's how you can see it in front of people. Oh, oh there it is. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another one? Yes. Yeah. 
Actually, so maybe if I can ask you just to flick back one, I don't know if that's possible. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is the... Oh. Yeah, I shouldn't have been given this clicker. <laughs> okay. I already put uh, this slide up here as, uh, as motivation. So this is just a typical um, interaction today where the server is making a call for um, demand, but then the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the workflow is uh, initiated by the client. So the client talks to the server, gets some ad back, and then it's making all of the calls uh, out to um, actually get the video to play and then firing all the tracking events. So if you can just go forward one now, Peter, please. And uh, you see just, it's basically the same diagram, but now all of the interaction is managed by the SSAI server. And a quick caveat, this isn't, this isn't the only way that this works, but uh, just to keep things simple, let's, let's just uh, take it like this. So there's really two, um, main problems, well, maybe three, that uh, the reason I'm here. Uh, one is about uh, non-human traffic detection. So the way this works certainly uh, for us is uh, we're interested to look at the whole breadcrumb trail of IP addresses that a request um, passed through to get to us from the client. So ordinarily in uh, you know, basic tag integrations, you've just got this, um, just these headers on the request that come to you, you've got the IP address of the machine that's calling you, and then you've got this breadcrumb trail of other machines. And that's fine, and, and what we do is we look at each of those uh, addresses to make sure that they're not on our blacklist. So now in this situation, um, you know, without the presence of a standard, what we see here is that breadcrumb trail mixes the IP address of the client, and then the address of the server, and then any other proxies that uh, were in the way on, along, the, along the path. And it's not possible for us to look at that list of addresses and figure out in a, uh, in a standard way what's the dividing line between information about the client and the information about the server. And uh, for us, our particular original case was uh, that SSAI server is running in AWS, and AWS is on our blacklist because that's where people may like to live and far off their bot traffic. So um, that traffic was dead. It's just a waste of time. And uh, that was really the motivation to solve that problem so that we can actually start monetizing this stuff. Um, let's see if there's anything else to touch on with that. Um, the second one is... Uh, information about uh, the device itself, so the user agent string. Uh, that's not directly a problem for us, but for our demand partners, where um, you know, it's a typical case that they will look at the user agent string that we passed in the bid request originally, and then again at the uh, user agent string that they then see from the client when the ad is playing, and compare those, and then uh, we'll complain if they're not the same. And if we're not both looking at the same piece of information uh, to identify that end client, then, then there's problems. So that's the second one. And then the third one is really the, the lack of access to, well, there's no cookies um, in this case, typically anyway, but there's, and there's, there's no standard way to identify that end device. And uh, that's just, just common sense to throw that one into the mix as well, right, to, uh, to do a better job. Right, right. Do Oh, well, I was going to say, like, um, what we've seen as well is that there's been an escalation of these scenarios uh, in the sense that um, while that client-side traditional execution flow is still very much uh, the broadly common use case uh, with SSAI and with a number of other use cases emerging like the uh, RTB ecosystem pre-fetching VAS tags or verification vendors uh, fetching VAS tags from the server as well, uh, that kind of number of potential combinations of how an ad gets uh, eventually run on a screen is just kind of exploded into a, a bunch of different scenarios. And um, I, I think that's been the driving factor in trying to finally tackle this workflow question uh, and, and trying to fix this uh, because this is going to get more common and it's eventually going to become the majority of traffic. Yeah. There's, there's one other point too about this too, is one of the, the interesting parts about uh, stitching ads, like if you think about like broadcast and stuff, there's one single stream and they stitch the ads in there. Now we can do the same thing in terms of any sort of player. And this becomes interesting with determining who's actually counting things because most of the actual impression counting could be done server side. 
There's a problem with that, because MRC says you have to signal where that impression counting is coming from. So it's really important that we put in things in VAS41 to allow this signaling to actually happen. To say, yes, the server is doing something on behalf of the client, but the server is trustworthy enough to actually do this. So it's really important that we have these mechanisms in place in 4.1 to allow these expanded use cases that were never really possible with older versions of VAST. Well, let's talk about those uh, mechanisms, I guess, now. Uh, do, do you want to talk a little bit about the history around that and uh, get into the details of what, what we've done? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so th this has been a pretty long process. Uh, I remember <laughs> us starting talking about this, what is it, like a year ago now? Um, and and we, we actually took several months, like fleshing out a bunch of different proposals, a number of different angles to try to tackle this issue. And I think the main factors that we've been trying to design for is, yeah, a, obviously something that actually fixes the workflow issue at, in a scalable way, like avoiding all the manual processes and workflows that have been happening so far. For example, trafficking 15,000 different tags for all 15,000 different scenarios. So like how can you deliver a single unified tag that just magically works everywhere? It's like the, the, the perfect situation that we want to get to. Um, so getting that problem solved, but on the other hand, something that the industry can easily adopt that doesn't like introduce like huge amounts of change. Uh, and then on the other hand, something that, um, that doesn't break stuff that exists today because we, we obviously want to have like a super smooth transition uh, going on uh, when we onboard this. So those were, I think, the, the core design principles that we were trying to solve for during the process. So I'll actually follow up on that a little bit. Um, part of that was uh, when we were actually talking about figuring, okay, how are we actually going to, to do this? Because you know, I was reminded by many people here that VAST is a response protocol. It is not a request protocol. So trying to turn VAST into a request protocol is probably something that's going to be saved for some later date. Um, so I was a big proponent of pushing things that OpenRTB has for signaling in the actual request. And eventually I saw the light and figured out that we should not make a crazy amount of changes and this should be more streamlined and non-breaking. So while you, know, you see things like OpenRTB has AdCom, for instance, um, we are obviously evaluating that, but we stuck with something that's actually used in the industry already, and it's going to be an easy thing to just bolt on the actual changes that we've done for 4.1, so you can actually have all these signals. So, But I'll just say that the actual discussions were very interesting and at some times very exciting. First standards group. Yeah, I think we can be, I think, quite satisfied with the, uh, the, the diligence we've done to, um, to try to smooth that path, because there are technical challenges with trying to get to a, um, you know, like an open RTB style request. That would be awesome if we could get there, but you know, they're just. I'm not going to get into it, but I mean, it's just um, ultimately we would just inevitably run up against a, a barrier there tr trying to push that through. And um, yeah, it was very important and I, uh, you know, to, to get something that was a, a low, uh, like a light lift and I yep. um, appreciate uh, help that we got particularly from Adobe and uh, from Brightcove to just look and see what was out there already and then and come to a standard that was going to be easy to adopt. Well, I, I think one of the key aspects that were, was very exciting to see during those discussions is that in, in that very broad, vast working group, um, everybody kind of came together and eventually concluded that um, that there is a path to bring this into the VAS specification to actually have a request side of the specification uh, that in the future there is an opportunity to direct that towards ADCOM OpenRTB style um, requesting and then response formats. Uh, but that we felt that we needed something that we could implement sooner. So uh, while we haven't um, remove that card from the table for the future. I think we, we have a great solution right now that can fix things today and then a clear path forward of where we want to go as an industry. And, and speaking of that, like one of the actual things that we weighed was the actual path forward. How fast can we actually get adoption for this standard? And you know, everybody in the working group was like, well, we want to do this now. We want to do this today. You know, this is a problem today that we want to solve. So. Um, Doing what we've done allows for this, you know, it's a low-hanging fruit approach, basically, that allows us to do a lot more signaling between clients, servers, SSAI, 
um, without really changing the way things are actually done right now. Right, and if I remember right, there are some really basic architectural changes that needed to be done around supporting posts and, and so on, right? Yes. Yeah, like from a technical perspective, getting like adcom requests into Vast would have meant um, like a, a lot of technical implementation changes. Like uh, you run into issues with uh, redirects uh, mm -hmm. in Vast requests. You'd run into issues with making post requests instead of get requests. Like. There's a bunch of these things that we flag to investigate in the future, and that's, I think, why we made the right call in the, <laughs> not delaying the standard for another two years trying to figure that part out. Yep. And so that's basically where the macro-based uh, solution uh, came into play, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, enough teasing, we should probably yeah. talk about the solution. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, do, do, yeah, I'll, I'll oh, yeah. Get, um, get into the details there. Of course. Uh, so <coughs> what we eventually landed on is that the industry has already been using uh, macros in, in URLs quite extensively to signal information from one party to another without actually having to establish a, like a common communication channel. A uh, good example is um, um, in tracking pixels, we were already supporting things like an error code macro so that if you, an error fired and a tracking pixel fires, uh, the player can actually signal what error happened to the ad server or the person looking at the tracking pixel. And what we eventually landed on uh, in the group is to say, well, why don't we leverage that same concept to a much more extensive degree? Why don't we allow the player to support a, a commonly defined set of macros that whenever it sees a vast URL coming from anywhere in the world, whether through an RTB auction or some kind of direct deal or any other channel, um, when it sees that URL, it can recognize all these predefined macros that we have uh, in um, uh, like 20 pages of the vast spec, basically. Um, and Every player can basically choose to um, to support certain macros or not. So it's not that we're mandating like a 20-page list of macros to support. You can basically select the ones that you're interested in and implement those. But when once you do, you start telling the vast server upfront uh, things like uh, which uh, um, APIs do I support? Do I support open measurement? Do I support vPaid? Um, which kind of media files do I support? What is kind of uh, the player that I'm running in? What is the device like? Will I be making server-side tracking pixel requests? Like all of that information can be forwarded upfront to the ad server. And then the ad server from this single tag can respond back with a different response every single time. If, it, if you tell it you'll support vPaid, great, it can send you a vPaid response. If you tell it you won't support vPaid, it actually knows not to send you a vPaid only response because that's going to break. Um, and this way, we can create a negotiation protocol between client and server that is um, going to tackle a bunch of different issues in the industry. Yeah, and to, to speak about that too, it, you know, I'm sure a lot of people are aware of like AdOps having these gigantic sheets of, of macros for different companies and different platforms and stuff. And one of the things we wanted to do was to standardize that across the actual industry. So using Vast, we thought it was a really good opportunity to say like, if you're going to support VAST and support the ecosystem in general, you should support these standard macros so somebody can actually give you a tag and not worry about having to replace it for any kind of system that you're actually using. So it was actually a really big step forward into like making the ecosystem interconnect to each other in an easy way to actually traffic ads across the entire chain. Yeah, and it's, it's worth saying as well that uh, this is not necessarily, it's not just a video solution, right? This is something that we do look uh, forward to. To spreading more broadly across other yes. formats, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but we uh, and then for for SSAI, um, we've introduced a couple of new HTTP headers. This is not rocket science, but it's just really. Um, I mean, the goal here is just to have an elegant way of separating that uh, client information from the server information. So, I mean, the, the kind of a good example um, is the user agent that I touched on already. We did have a discussion about this. Like, what is the uh, when you get a, an SSAI call calling for demand, what is what should be in the user agent string? It's like this is the stuff that goes on right sure. behind the scenes. <clears throat> and uh, you know, my argument is that, uh, which is I think where we we ended up, is the, the 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 component making the call gets to set those standard headers. And so then the question is, well, where does all the stuff about the client go? So uh, we've just. Uh, defined um, a set of headers for that property uh, and a bunch of other properties that uh, come from the client so they can live in a natural place, uh, in, a, in a standard place on the request. 
easy to spot and get. And uh, so now all of the information about the client is in one bucket, all the information about the server is in another bucket. And it's, uh, it's easy. It's just like OpenRTB, right, where uh, all that information about the client is in the request, uh, in the body of the request, and all the information about the server is, is in the headers, separate. So just to follow up on that point, the presentation before was talking about standards on the internet. And we felt it was really important to make sure that, you know, specifically for user agents, that the thing calling was the user agent that's presented in the actual user agent header. So technical, little technical background, but that's why we actually overrode uh, additional headers to actually send that to right. the client. Yeah, and like spoofing user agents, that's <laughs> generally considered uh, an indicator of fraudulent behavior. Right. So we, we kind of wanted to avoid the industry standardizing on like spoofed user agents uh, moving forward. So uh, we've talked about uh, uh, the ad requests, of course. We talked about the uh, headers. Uh, there's one other area in terms of the uh, you know, workflow-related updates in VAS 4.1, uh, which I'd love to get into a little more, uh, which is the uh, identifiers that are uh, standardized as well. Uh, Alan, do you want to? Sure. So um, universal ad ID was talked about, so I'm not going to cover that too much. But you know, it's important to to understand that basically, like having a unique identifier for the actual creative, the asset, and stuff, really important. Um, separately than that, for VAS 4.1, we've actually added two distinct identifiers at the request time. One comes from the publisher side, one comes from the actual advertiser side. So if you look at the actual workflow, that's actually, could you flip back? Back to or forward. SSEI? Nah, the, the one with the servers in there. There you go. All right. So let's just take the, the simple case of the client server right now. So when the actual client makes a request, we've added something called the transaction ID. Now, if you're familiar with OpenRTB, you'll know that this field actually exists within OpenRTB. So the, the theory, and hopefully this will happen in practice, is that once the client makes a request, it says, I'm going to have a transaction ID. It's a UUID. It gets passed along the request. If you actually have it in an auction, you can actually pass that same transaction ID to however many demand sources that you want. The server will also take that request. And then you'll actually be able to correlate that specific request by impression to everything that happens within that chain from the actual publisher side, the client side. And then we added another ID because there are cases where the server can respond with multiple ads. So the, the advertising side was like, well, we'd also like another ID to go the other way. When we actually serve a response, we want to serve an ad serving ID. So that is also done. So now you have two IDs, one from the advertiser side that can actually go back down the chain. So after you have, let's just say you have three intermediate servers, the last one should say, my advertising ID is whatever it is. Each one of those servers that gets tracking events or however it's going to actually do events will actually have a macro in there to say like, OK, my advertising ID from this server is this. My transaction ID from the actual client is this they'd be able to actually reconcile, by an impression, everything happening on that single chain of events. And that's really big in the industry. So we're really providing things to allow you to dig into data, dig into analytics, really solve errors, you know, not before they happen, but at least to mitigate them, to understand, like, OK, you can quickly identify clients, quickly identify servers. So it's, it's really big to have things that allow you to tie together two separate systems that have their own IDs. Yeah, and I think you touched on an important point is like um, one of the key use cases for this is when you're trying to trace down breakage or error scenarios. Like right now, you would have to correlate IDs from all these different companies. Each of them would have a different ID for the same impression. So you need to figure out how they like how you link all those data sets together to eventually figure out what went wrong. Mm. And as soon as everyone tracks with the same ID, you end up in a situation where suddenly magically all the data sets across the industry are immediately correlated uh, so that solving breakage issues becomes a much more feasible feat. Exactly. All right, um, before we get into Q&A, uh, any, any comments about the future? What, uh, what should people be doing? What should, be, what, what should they be looking forward to? So I mentioned briefly about Adcom. Um, not going to say that it's going to make it into the next VAS standard or not, but you know we should think about you know having a. You should think about the industry moving towards a more robust uh, request protocol for, for video ad serving in general. Um, so that's just something, to, just something to think about in the back of your minds. 
but not, but we're not going to have any breaking changes. So <laughs> without like rolling, you know, major versions. So nothing to worry about now. But you know, keep it in the back of your minds that we, as an industry, should think about actually having signaling at the forefront, so we don't have these potential problems that we've had in previous forms of the VAST standard. Uh, maybe as an indicator of that, uh, I, I do believe in VAST 1, we put one single sentence that says, you should accept <laughs> HTTP post as well as HTTP get. Not that we're going to need it right now, but we might in the future. So start preparing your servers to accept posts as well. I think uh, <clears throat> for me, the, um, the key message is just, this is not a high bar. Um, it should be just better for everyone if we, uh, if we adopt this, right? So if, you know, thinking selfishly for, SSAI, there are some there are some small changes that just really smooth the path and uh, make it a lot much more likely that uh, everybody on the chain is speaking the same language and your know, monetization is going to be um, better. I think really speaking for the macros, it's essentially the same thing, right? It's just, it, it makes your life easier. You have less unique tags to put out there. You have uh, more you know, uh, dynamic. The, the context is accurate, easier to convey it. So, Peter. Yeah, and I was actually going to loop that back to my original point at the start of the uh, our conversation was that um, the industry is still stuck at VAS2, right? Like, how do we get people to upgrade? And, and what we're proposing today is basically that upgrade path. Because what will happen is one of those macros that we put in is which VAS versions do you support as a player? Which means that if you as a player request, whether an SSAI server or a client-side player, anything, you can actually tell the server ahead of time which VAST versions you'll accept back. And then the server can respond with VAST 2, 3, 4, 4, 1, whatever they like, uh, as long as it matches your supported set of versions. Which means that you can traffic a single tag that kind of magically transforms itself into a 2, 3, 4, 4, 1 tag, depending on what that specific situation that is going to be executed in at that point in time. Um, and that just kind of simplifies all those workflows so tremendously and, and actually gives us a path to traffic attack. If it runs in VAS2 inventory, great. If it runs in VAS4 one inventory, perfect as well. So, and, and just to add to that, I'm not a big fan of backporting features uh, to previous versions of VAS, but this is actually something that uh, I think everyone should do. I mean, this is not, it's not tied to any particular VAS version, so add requests is something that everyone should be able to start supporting immediately with macros. Uh, I guess it's time for some uh, Q&A. Uh, any, anyone have any questions? Please raise your hand if you have Q&A. All, right, All right, one back here. Go. Coming on over, I have Mike one. Hey, you've said most people are on VAST2. Do you have numbers of how many people are on each of the VAST versions, roughly? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have numbers, but anecdotally, I think. Oh, sorry. Do you, do you... No, 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 I don't. <laughs> that was a good question, though. Yeah, I, I, I do. Like, of course, all of our data sets are distorted somewhat by the use cases that we service. Um, but I remember that we looked at this a couple of months ago, and it was like 95% plus fast too uh, on, on our side. Yeah. You mentioned uh, MRC association with uh, server side ad insertion measurement. It, has the MRC bought into this? approach of signaling, or is that still TBD as far as their sort of acceptance of the methodology for client signaling? So you'll have to direct that specific question to the MRC, yeah. but as far as I'm aware, and I could be wrong, that they are in the process of doing that, but one of the things is that they you actually have to tell them who's doing the counting too. But in general, no, the, M the MRC basically always says like, it has to be in the client, it has to be in the client, but you know, the industry is changing, so standards should change along with the industry. And, and we're, we're trying to make sure that from a specification level, we've been collaborating with the verification vendors on this particular question as well, is we're trying to make sure that from a specification perspective, VAST at least signals all of this information. If you get a tracking event, who triggered it? Was it a client? Was it a server? And then the standardization and, and uh, accreditation bodies like the MRC can then say, well, if it's signaled as coming from the client, we'll accept it or not. Otherwise, we run the risk. We throw it all in one bucket, and you can't tell the difference anymore. And then you run into a lot of issues. Any other questions? All right. If not, thank you so much, uh, uh, Peter, uh, Aaron, and uh, Simon. Thank you. Thank you.